Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. Tonight, Sensible Money's founder and CEO, Dana Anspa, and the founder of the Retirement Manifesto, Fritz Gilbert, will talk us through five keys to retirement success. Dana's recognized as one of the nation's leading authorities on decumulation planning, and no surprise to any of us here, Sensible Money was just named this year a best place to work for financial advisors by Investment News. She's the author of Control Your Retirement Destiny, the popular guide to decumulation planning. You can also find this as a podcast on Apple, Spotify, and iTunes. Her popular online course, How to Plan for the Perfect Retirement, is available at thegreatcourses.com. Fritz is the founder of The Retirement Manifesto, an award-winning blog focused on helping people achieve a great retirement. He is also the author of Keys to a Successful Retirement, Staying Happy, Active, and Productive in Your Retired Years. Fritz retired from the corporate world in 2018 at the age of 55 and has since enjoyed helping others on their journey to and through retirement. I'm Nancy Fellinger, one of the financial planners here at Sensible Money, and I'm in Pawleys Island, South Carolina. Most of the team is based in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we also have team members in Massachusetts, Florida, Oregon, Indiana, and South Dakota. We work seamlessly with each other and with clients in 38 states every day using some of the same technology we're using tonight. So with that, Dana and Fritz, let's get started. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nancy. I am going to, of course, put up our necessary disclosures. And while those are up, I, I like to remind everyone we use examples. Um, of course, we cannot guarantee retirement outcomes. I think everybody knows that. And uh, we still have to put the disclosures up to remind you of that. So that being said, we are going to jump right in. And where I want to start is to learn a little bit more about who we have joining us tonight. So I am going to launch a poll. And basically, we're going to be asking if you are already retired, uh, if you are within 10 years of your desired retirement date, or if you are more than 10 years away, or I have this one in the financial service industry or in the press. So sometimes we have people attend because they might want to get content or topics to write about or their fellow advisors. So uh, if that's you, you can answer this last one. So I'm going to launch the poll. So it looks like we have about 45% of our attendees tonight that are within 10 years of their desired retirement date, about 52% who are already retired, that's fantastic, and about 2% who answered in the industry. So that's fantastic too, we always welcome you. And so this uh, topic is absolutely pertinent to those of you in these two groups, so it's good to know. Now, one of the things Fritz and I wanted to talk about was this concept. He's known as a do-it-yourselfer. He has a blog that tells you how to do it yourself. And I obviously am a professional financial planner and, and run a firm. So is this going to be a war? So I, I can't Fritz, believe you had me on the show, Dana. This is like <laughs> sacrilege. Should we duke it out here? <laughs> no, no, no. I, you know, I, I should say on the DIY side, this is an area where if you're not really comfortable doing it yourself, people say, hey, are you kind of anti-advisor? Not at all. I think this is an area that's so important. If you're not 100% comfortable, I've been doing this stuff since I was in my early 20s. I've just always had an interest in it. Read back when there were trade journals, you know, Money Magazine, Kiplinger's in the hard, getting the mail every month. I, I've been reading this stuff for 40 years. I've probably listened to thousands of hours of podcasts on my commutes to work. I've always had an interest in this stuff. And I, and I just have a I, I've, I'm comfortable with it. And this is an area, if you're not, hey, professionals, absolutely. This is an area where it pays to pays to, to get a professional insight. And even in my case, knowing this stuff pretty well, before I actually pulled the plug on retirement, I, I got with Roger Whitney at the Retirement Answer Man, had him look stuff over for me and say, hey, are there any blind spots I'm not aware of? It, it's too important to, to not recognize the value of professional advice. So I applaud what you do. And you do a great job of it. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate that. You know, I've had a philosophy for years that good advice is good advice, whether you want to do it yourself, find someone to help you do it or find someone to do it for you. 
And, you know, one of the things that's my pet peeves is when someone's like, absolutely should never talk to advisor or you should always talk to, you know, there isn't an always or a never. So I, I love what you just said. Um, I think it's know, know what you know and, and get help in the areas that you don't know. Yeah. Along those lines, this is an older study, but it shows the formal, you know, written retirement plans have a substantial impact on retirement behavior. So this was a study done by the Secure Retirement Institute, and they found that of the people they polled, these were pre-retirees that they polled, you know, 50% said they felt very prepared for retirement if they had a formal written plan. The green answers were the retirees and pre-retirees with no formal written plan. So 80% um, had estimated how long their assets would last, if they had a formal written plan and 78% that had a formal written plan had a specific plan for how they would generate income from their savings. Now, I know in one of your blog posts that's titled the four phases of retirement blog, you have a sentence and it says the highest correlation I've found between retirees who have a smooth transition versus those who struggle is the amount of time they've spent preparing both financially and non-financially before retirement. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, as I was probably three years out, I started my blog three years before I retired, so I've been writing eight years now, I guess. And uh, so that was 2015, so nine years. Um, and one of my things that I was really curious about, I was really starting to get serious about retirement, and I just was exploring different things. So I, I started the blog just as a, hey, I'm going to see if I like this, maybe it's something I'll do in retirement. I was already starting to test the waters and experiment with different things that might become part of my retirement life, which I encourage everybody to do. And fortunately for me, it's turned into something I enjoy and, and I get fulfillment out of. But early on, my biggest question was, what's the difference between people that have had a good transition and those that haven't? And I did a lot of research on it. I've written some posts about it. And there is absolutely clear, and in my book, Key Sort of Successful Retirement, it's the only key that I repeated twice. You know, I, I did it on purpose. And, and that is, Spend as much time as you can. And, and one of the problems, I applaud you because you've recognized this, but a lot of the financial services industry hasn't recognized that that planning can't just be financial. You know, financial is necessary, absolutely critical, but it is not in itself sufficient. You've got to include the non-financial elements and think about the things you're going to be giving up when you leave the workplace. And, and the more, to your point about the four phases, and we'll talk about that later, but the reason people get hung up in some of the tougher stages is typically when they haven't spent enough time thinking about the non-financial areas. Those are the ones that get people tripped up. So have a written plan. I've got a written plan. I'm DIY, but I've got a written plan. But I've also, as you see through my writing, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the non-financial as well. So just make sure you're, you're touching on both of them. Yeah, and that's why I was really excited to have you join us tonight because we're going to be talking about both and, and we'll cover the five keys in a moment, but we will be talking about both the financial and the non-financial. And I think you're absolutely right. There has to be an integration. Now, before we dig in uh, to the meat of what we're going to discuss tonight, I do want to have a second poll since we have so many people here who are about you know half within 10 years and half already retired. So with this poll, we're going to ask if you feel prepared for retirement. So we've got five answers here and let me get that poll pulled up and I'm going to launch it. Only 1% answered no, I don't feel ready. So that's great. Uh, about 29% of you said not yet, but you're going to do the work. So we love to hear that. Um, I love this. 25% said, yes, I'm ready. About 35% I'm retired and loving it. And about 10% I'm retired and struggling. And so for that 10%, we have a slide to talk specifically around that topic. And, and so we'll get there. Um, so thank you, everybody. So what we plan on covering tonight with our five keys are number one, that you have to map out your cash flow. And we'll be asking Fritz how he did that. And we'll be showing an example of how we do that for our clients. We'll be discussing that you really need to invest boringly. Despite what the media says, the right way to do it is pretty boring. That it's important to simplify. And then the topics that I think are so much fun and so important are how you can really be intentional about what you want to do in retirement and how you used your time and the importance of finding purpose. And I, I absolutely am thrilled to have Fritz here to, to join us on these topics. 
Now, as we start into mapping cash flow, I just want to side note, these images you see were made by ChatGPT. So I literally said, make me an image that represents map cash flow. And, and here's what I got. So that's just a fun side note. So Fritz, tell us, you know, we've heard of the 80% rule, you know, you're, you're going to spend about 80% of your income. That's what you should budget for. How did you go about doing this part of it? Yeah, and, and I applaud this being the first one. As I said, financials are absolutely critical. There's more to it, but you've got to do the financials. And actually, in 2015, I wrote a post, When Can I Retire? And I, I basically walked through, and, I, and a lot of it was based on your book, by the way, Dana. I, I, I used your book because I was planning for retirement, so that was great. Um, but we never budgeted. We always saved pretty aggressively. We increased, if I got a raise, we'd take the majority of the raise and increase our savings and just take home a little bit less. So we were always saving aggressively. And we just lived on the rest and, and that worked for us it was fine um never got into debt big problems or anything like that so but we knew going into retirement it's a math problem ultimately right the, the the financial side of it's a math problem and you've got to figure out how much are you going to spend and how much can you generate from your investments plus social security pensions you know side hustles whatever else you've got and and those are the relatively easy parts to answer compared to some of the other stuff so so we spent, never tracked the dime. We always just, you know, spent what we had left over in checking, but we spent 11 months and we tracked every single dime. It was painful, right? I'd stick the receipts in my pocket. I'd get to my computer. I had a spreadsheet. We itemized it by category. We did the whole thing because we said, this is one thing we, we can get. These are hard numbers. There's so many difficult to answer questions, but how much you spend right now is a question anybody can answer. You just got to do the hard work. So we did that. And then we, then we said, okay, let's think about how our life is going to change in retirement. And we took our actual spending pre-retirement and we said, okay, we want to go traveling in an RV. Great. Let's figure out, number one, you got to make sure you got the, the cash set aside to buy the toys, right? So that was all part of our pre-retirement planning. But then we said, okay, we're going to go camping 100 nights a year. It's going to cost us $30 a night on average. We're going to drive so many miles at so many miles per gallon. We got to that level of detail. And wow. we said, okay, we're going to sell the big house in the city. We're going to move to the mountains, which we did. We paid off the mortgage using the equity. Okay, that changes. Taxes will go down, property taxes. So we literally went category by category and said, okay, how is our life going to change in retirement to the best of our knowledge? And what would that look like financially? Best guess. Healthcare, huge one, right? I'm, 50, I'm still only 61. I've been retired six years. So we had to do private pay insurance for 10 years. Well, what's that going to cost? We we estimated high, and we we built in. We we would rather have surprises to the good than surprises to the bad, so we were conservative. That's the spending side. Then we did the same thing on the inflow, the income side. We took our portfolio, which is exactly the way I think you do it with your clients. We can move it to your your thing because it's very similar. And we said, okay, let's look at safe withdrawal rates. We've got a couple more years of work. I'm going to continue to save. That'll grow the portfolio to the X. And then let's look at a you know, three, three and a half and 4% safe withdrawal rate coming out of those assets. And oh, by the way, a lot of that's pre-tax. So we got to pay taxes to get it out. We factored that in. And we looked at income versus expenses. And we said, okay, when do those lines cross? That's when we can target retirement. So you've got to do this stuff. You do. And it's funny hearing you rattle it off, right? It sounds pretty simple. And I, I agree with you, right? It is the one thing, like how much you spend, right? You can know that. And there are so many unknowns in retirement. I think that's a really excellent point you make. It is something you can know. And while it sounds simple, wow, it can be an awful lot of work. Yeah. Um, you know, and for particularly you and I are spreadsheet minded, right? I love spreadsheets. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, you know, for us, it's like, yeah, you know, map all of this out. And and so I'll show an example and I'm going to blow this up for our audience of, of how we do it. So here we have, you know, section A, we call it the non-investment inflows and all names and, and identifying information in this example have been changed. So this is a hypothetical couple, Guy and Belinda. And here we show they're retiring now at 64 and 67, but social security for Belinda is, is scheduled to start when she starts 70, her birthday's partway through the year, and Guy, um, not till he turns 70. And so when we get out here and they're both collecting full social security, they're going to have $78,000 a year, but they need that amount of income and, and more starting now. And so 
when we calculate what they need, we have this expenses and taxes. And just like you mentioned, Fritz, you know, there's home taxes and insurance um, that are separated out from upkeep and repairs that are separate from living expenses. There's an auto in here. There's out of pocket medical. Now, I'm not sure why that doesn't start for one year. Maybe that's an error in my example, because obviously you're going to have out of pocket medical starting now. We've got health insurance, and you're going to see here the Part B and D premiums kicking in as they each transition onto Medicare. Now, in this case, there's not a mortgage, but one of the things, as you mentioned, how detailed you get is we will separate out the principal and interest portion of the mortgage because when that's paid off, um, the taxes and insurance will continue. And we've seen people who forget that, right? They, they, oh, my mortgage will be paid off. So that, you know, they, right now they have the taxes and insurance wrapped into the payment. But you got to remember that if that's the case, that portion of the payment will continue when, when that mortgage is paid off. And so what we do here is we calculate this gap. So this is what we anticipate they would need to withdraw each year. This is the first 10 years and it starts off a little higher. And then the reason it gets lower is because social security kicks in and so they need less from their portfolio, but their expenses don't go lower. Those are still going up each year because we've added inflation in. Then we take these withdrawals and we get down to a very granular level of what account will they come out of. So if I go back one slide, I can see we had 91,000 Let's get my laser pointer back. 91,684 coming out this year. And here, if we look at the details, there was a deferred comp payout coming out and then distributions from IRAs and distributions from what we call the non-retirement bucket. This might be a brokerage account, trust, joint account. And that totals exactly up to what we estimated they would withdraw. So it's mapped out each year. I'm curious, Fritz, in your plan, you know, did you get down to the level of mapping what accounts it would come out of? Yeah, I, I did actually. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting, Dana, because I put a lot of work into this. Basically, I recreated what you what you do on a regular basis with your clients. But the funny thing is, since I've retired, I don't even look at it because now we're, we're you, you, you focus so much on this when you're making that decision of when can you retire. But once you make that decision and actually get into living it, you kind of get used to the, you know, what you you know what you have, and you you get if you did your planning well, it becomes much less of a of a concern. Now every year we'll look at our, you know, we'll, we'll readjust our annual paycheck that we create. We'll look at our net worth. We'll see how it's changed. We'll look at the safe withdrawal rates against it, and we'll 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 flex our spending a little bit. But that's the extent of it. I don't go through the level of detail anymore because now, just like when I was working. We've created a paycheck, and if the money's in our checking account, we know we can spend it. So this level of detail, it, it'd be interesting. With and I was I was going to mention, it's really it's it's neat that half of the people listening right now are retired, and half of Mark, because that's about the same as my reader base. And I hear consistently that once you're retired, now I'm sure for your clients, you still go through this and you update it and you keep it updated. But but for the most part, it's really really important on the pre-retirement side. And it becomes less so in the post-retirement side as long as you have spending guardrails in place and you and you can manage your spending within a safe withdrawal rate. That's the key once you retire. Yeah, and I it's I've seen studies that show how much time people spend leading up to retirement about the money side of things, and then exactly what you said, two years after retirement, they don't even think about the money anymore, yeah. which yeah. is I actually reassuring. I actually did, I actually did I've got an article at um, how much how much how uh, let's see. Uh, how much time do I spend managing our money? And I actually did an analysis. It's 0.23% of my time per year, 20 <laughs> hours a year. That's all wow. it takes for us to manage our money. It, it's not a big process. Now, we set up a very good program going into it. So it's basically maintenance, right? You do a little bit yeah. of you know, refill, refilling the buckets. You might do some reallocation, rebalancing, and you do a year-end review. You do a raw conversion. But I actually broke down in that post how much time I spend each one of those. And I was shocked that it's only about 20 hours a year that I spend actually managing this stuff. And it's 100% yeah. DIY. So yeah. other than my taxes. I have a CPA do the taxes, but that's it. So. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, as you said, we update this level of detail for our clients every year. 
Um, but part of that's because we're fine tuning things like how much can we sell up to a certain tax rate, you know, the exact right. amount of the Roth conversion. And so for us, a lot of redoing this analysis every year is because we are making the decisions and we need this to yeah. make the decisions. Whereas yeah. if you're doing it yourself, you can ballpark it, you know, as a professional, we can't ballpark it. We have to yeah. have a, a formula to follow. Um, yeah. And, you know, of course, retirement doesn't necessarily always stay the same. You know, people get into retirement and then they might say, hey, can we take our family on this dream vacation to Disney or to Alaska? Can we buy this house we've always wanted? And so then we find, you know, we're rerunning iterations and, and all those things that, that you do. I think I followed your blog and you may have moved or bought a different cabin. Is that right? Yeah, we did. Moving from good to good to great, or move from good to great is what that series is. Good to called. great. Good, good I remember that I'm one. Yeah. 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 And so, right, during those things, then you 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 for us, we have to redo the yeah. analysis and re-stress test and make sure it's affordable. As did I. Let's let's not let's not um understate the importance of especially <laughs> when you're making big decisions. We kind of do the same type of analysis. You know, I'll, I'll basically when we're looking at that. We'll look at our net worth. We'll say, okay, let's assume we pull out X to buy a house. Let's look at our new safe withdrawal rate against the lower balance of our net worth, spendable net worth. Obviously, your net worth would be the same. You're just moving it from you know a liquid asset to a non-liquid asset. So we don't count that anymore, right? Because you don't spend your house. So yep. I, we have retirement spendable assets. So those go down. So your spending has to go down a little bit if you're going to spend some of it, unless your assets are growing fast enough that now, hey, the market's done really well, we're only at 3% safe withdrawal rate, guess what, we can splurge a little bit. And, and the vast majority of retirees tend to underspend. So it is yes, important to have a process where you can, you can give yourself the freedom to spend. And that's, I think, where you can provide a service. Yeah, you, can, you guys can get that second home, no problem, you're, you're fine, right? Even if yeah. you're DIY, you can't panic and not make those decisions. You've gotta have a process that lets you look at your financials, objectively yep. and determine if you can spend the money and and that's the joy of retirement is being able to do the things you've always wanted to do you don't want the financials to hold you back if you've got enough money to do it so but you've got to you've got to look, look at the financials with the big decisions absolutely yeah and i love it and you look at all the same type of metrics that we look at you've just developed a, a method which is exactly what we tell everybody you have to yeah. have a method or a process yeah now the example I used here was actually a relatively simple cash flow map. I have a second one that's quite a bit more complex because oftentimes we are working with complex clients. You know, in this case, look at all the different sources of cash flow they have. This person has, you know, social security starting later, but a pension, deferred comp payouts, they have a uh, installment loan note they're receiving from the sale of a commercial property. We have to separate it out into how it's taxed. There's a return of principal portion. There's a return of basis um, or, you know, capital tax portion taxes, capital gains. And then there's a separate piece that's taxed as what's called section 1250 income. So we have to, to lay all of that out. They have syndication income from some real estate investments. And we have all of their expenses and we have a lot of um, extra go-go spending here because they're in the middle of moving to a, they have their own two homes and they're middle of moving to a second home. That's going to require some remodel and, and, and so on. And so when you look at all of this, you can see how much the cash flow inflows can vary and from year to year, how much the outflows can vary. And so this is a case where, Every year we have to adjust what comes out of the portfolio based around all of these other things. And these are just estimates. They're never gonna work out exactly like this. So there can be very simple situations where someone has you know, a 401k and a trust account, great. Um, and, and they might say, why would someone ever hire a financial planner? And then there's very complex situations where you go, oh my gosh, no wonder someone wants help uh, mapping all of this out. I, I tell you the other thing too, and we can move on because we're only on the first one and we're 30 minutes in. We could spend hours talking about this stuff. We you could. and I both love it. But the other thing that, that, that adds complexity is when you're trying to figure out how much can you do as a Roth conversion. Um, you know, we're doing them aggressively. We'll talk about that shortly. But that's a cash flow implication because you're you want to do the Roth conversions, but it's going to cost you in current liquid cash flow because you got to pay the taxes. So you know, the Roth conversion is kind of a variable you can adjust. And it has a huge impact on the on the year-to-year -year cash flows as well. 
It does. It does in terms of the tax liability. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on, uh, we're going to be talking about investing boringly. Now, I want to ask you, you know, how did you invest before retirement? Would you call it boring? And and what changed? Yeah, I've been all along, Dana, 100%. Well, I've always had a play account, you know, a little TD Ameritrade got bought by Charles Schwab now. So maybe 5% of our assets that I play around do stupid trades and trade options and stuff. But 95% of our portfolio, it was primarily a 401k, diversified mutual funds, pretty basic asset allocation. Um, and, and it, it, you know, it, that that works, right? You want to be diversified. Um, you you want to have the majority in stocks over the long term, but you've got to have, especially you get closer to retirement, you've got to start thinking about how you're going to buffer against that sequence of return risk if the bear markets come early in retirement. But beyond that, it's diversify, low cost, and it's not rocket science. It just takes time and compounding, and and it, there you don't want to chase exotic stuff. You want to keep it simple, and that's the way we've yeah. always done it. Now, let me ask: when you say low cost, primarily your index funds? Yeah, yeah, we're Vanguard. Okay. We had a, fortunately we had a 401k at work that was Vanguard. So early on in my career, we started with a 401k, and then as we started setting up our own personal accounts, you know, we just went with Vanguard as well. So everything we have is Vanguard. And, uh, yeah. and and just typically just you know broad based mutual funds. So you know we do have a small we have we have a little bit of a tilt. I'm a Paul Merriman fan. I know you know Paul. So we do a little yeah. bit of small. You know we have a little bit of a small value tilt, and we have a little bit okay. of international exposure. So we we I do look at that. And when we look at our asset allocation, I do think about you know do, so yeah a little bit of a tilt, but everything we've got is in diversified mutual funds. Okay. Yeah. And I know we could deep dive, um, kind of keeping it high level. You have a blog post specifically, I think, on this bucket strategy. What's it called? How to Create a Retirement Paycheck, the bucket strategy yeah. series. Um, so just walk us through, you know, high level. How do you use these buckets? How did you you come up with this and, and get it started? Yeah, I, I certainly didn't invent this. And I, I give the, the credit to whoever came up with the original concept. But the, the concept is it's basically asset allocation, or you can look at it as time segmentation. You know, when do you need the money and how best do you invest it given when you need it? And I, we're a conservative investor, my wife and I. So we chose to have about three years of cash. Now, when I was working, we only kept about six months of cash, right? So now you want to go to three years of cash because we didn't want to have that risk of a bear hanging over our head and if we only had six months of cash and we had to sell stocks and they've gone down oh we're going to cut our spending we didn't want to deal with that in retirement so we said okay let's build our cash buffer up to three years of cash so we started about three years before retirement and we started kind of redirecting some of my ongoing savings from work away from the 401k right because it's got to be after tax it's got to be accessible so we we took the tax hit and we we quit doing the pre-tax deductions and we moved it into cash and we gradually built that cash up to about three years. And if you think about it, if, if you've got 30 years worth of spending, which is a 3.3% a safe withdrawal rate, right? If you take, everybody says, if you have 25 times your savings, you can typically retire, that's a 4%. So let's just use 30 years because it makes the math easy. If you've got 30 years worth of spending in your portfolio and you've got three years in cash, that's a 10% asset allocation, pretty simple. Now think about six years in the second bucket, that's typically bonds. That's a little less volatility, but you're generating a little bit more income. Six years out of 30, that's 20%. So it kind of breaks down the same way as an asset allocation would. It says this is about a 70-30 approach. And what you find in time, which I think is what most people would, would recommend, is you'll, you'll tend to see a rising allocation to stocks over time because once your cash and bucket two are full, you no longer continue to fund those. You let the rest just go into bucket three and grow. So if the markets return more than your safe withdrawal rate, let's say you're spending 4% to make the math easy and the market's growing 8% a year, you're going to have an extra 4% of your portfolio every year. And typically that tends to fall into bucket three. So bucket three tends to get bigger. Buckets one and two tend, tend to kind of be capped and you manage them. And then as they come down, a couple times through the year, we'll look at our asset allocation and say, okay, we, we know. The one thing we did, which really works well, I'll mention it. When we set up the bucket one cash, we set it all in a separate account. We used Capital One Money Market, Capital One 360, and we just set up a paycheck that comes out of there every year, every month. So once a month, we get a paycheck. So we can look anytime by looking at the January balance in that account and the current balance, and we can see how much we've spent. 
and we can say, okay, let's try to top that off because the markets are doing really well. Or guess what? The markets aren't doing so well. Let's just let it continue to draw down for a while, which is what we did last year. Now the markets are back up. Everything's fine. We're keeping them full. So we tend to try to keep buckets one and two full when the markets are doing well and we're comfortable drawing them down. Yeah, if you get into a 1929 era depression, it might not work. But short of that, it, it's worked really well for us. I love it. Yeah, it's interesting because it's so similar to what we do. Um, and, you know, we never coordinated on this. Uh, no. Maybe some differences, uh, you know, I think you mentioned you rebalance annually. Do you ever rebalance where you're taking from bucket two and going back into bucket three? Has that ever happened? Uh, not since I've retired because bonds obviously haven't, haven't you know, performed as well as, as the stock market in, in the time frame since I've retired. But but certainly we have a spreadsheet and all this is linked to the net worth. So every year at the end yeah. of the year, we update our net worth. It automatically tells me how much we've got in each bucket. And if we got into a situation where bucket two was suddenly eight years, guess what? We wouldn't be 10, 20, 10% cash, 20% bonds. We'd now be 25% bonds. And we would say, okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna rebalance and your bonds are 25 and your stocks down a little bit, you would you would move some from bucket two into bucket three because your asset allocation would dictate that you do that. So it's 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 kind of hard to get your head around because it's a it's a blend of both asset allocation and refilling the buckets. But it's, yeah. it's not as hard to manage as I thought it would be because realistically, we look at it when the markets are good. Okay, let's take some cash and put it in there. And and every year end, we do a deep dive, and that's when we'll make our real reallocation decisions. Yep. Yeah, and we you know do it very similarly. Our rebalancing only goes one direction. So our bonds mature, they pour into cash. When our growth uh, is above a certain personal target, so it's a, what we call a critical path for each client, then we will sell growth and replenish bonds. But overall, it's, it's very, very similar. It's so similar that in our uh, portfolio reporting software, this is how we report. So we report yeah. cash, income, growth, and funny, uh, you know, our allocation is 70, 24, five. And so, you know, we don't, don't need to keep three years in cash because our bonds are, are held to maturity. So, you know, we know when they mature, they're gonna, gonna dump in here. But overall, it's, yeah. it's very, very similar um, philosophies that we have. Now, there's also a, a blog post you have on your asset location framework, different than yeah. allocation. So walk us through this. Yeah, and I'll keep this short because this gets pretty pretty detailed, but this was based on, I read a Morningstar article and they said basically where your assets are can reduce your tax liability over the course of your retirement. And the example they used was a, a, a couple with a million dollars. I think it was a 50-50 allocation. And in their example, I actually, I did, I looked at it today, they saved $74,000 over the course of their retirement. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's per million. So if you've got, let's say 5 million, you're talking about, you know, 200 plus thousand dollars of tax savings. And the concept is to, to keep it simple, think of the stuff that's going to grow the, the most, your stocks. Where do you want them to be? You want them to be in a Roth because that's tax free. Okay. That, that's pretty simple. Where yeah. are your where are your investments taxed the same as income? Bonds. Bonds fit really well in a before tax because when you're pulling that before tax money out, it's taxed as income. So it doesn't really hurt you to have bonds in there, but it could really hurt you to have stocks in there because you don't get the capital gains benefit because it's before tax. You're paying personal income tax marginal rate on all the growth that's in your before tax portfolio. So you want to keep that to the lowest growing. So not you, it's not you can't auto. What if you only have a two hundred thousand dollar Roth, you know, and, and you've got a two million dollar portfolio? Well, you can't have all of your stocks in Roth and all your bonds in before tax. But to the extent that you can, managing it a little bit like this, you can still keep the same asset allocation. You can still work with your buckets. But if you spend a little bit of time, and that's what that article went through, was basically how I've been intentional, especially as I'm doing my Roth conversions. I might have bonds and stocks that I'm converting, but I will move the stocks all into the Roth. And I may, I may sell, you, you, can, you can swap assets within a class. So I may sell um, stocks in, in before tax and buy more bonds. 
yeah. you know, so you can you can move money around within the within the asset classes by doing a buy sell and a buy sell, and you can get them over time into a into a optimized location. Mike, Michael Kitsis and, and uh, Wade Powell they talk a lot about this as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of people that talk about this. Probably too detailed for our keep it simple concept of our five keys, <laughs> but it's yeah. something you can do that you should talk to your advisor. And I'm sure Danny, you probably do this with your clients because there is tax savings to it. Yeah, it's almost identical. And that tax savings is, is a huge aspect of what we do. I hadn't seen that Morningstar article. I'd love to see it because, you know, I love that. Um, I'll send you the yeah. link. Yeah. Yeah, because it's true. You know, that's one of the areas where we do feel like we add value, where we're able to do it for someone if it's not something they want to spend their time doing. And we're actually adding real value um, by, by this kind of location framework. Yeah. Now, Moving um, one last question on the invest boringly. This is one of my favorite cartoons. So tell me, you know, how do you stay calm and rational? Probably the first bear market since you retired would have been COVID. You know, how, how do you handle that? And, and how often do you expect it to happen? You know, it, it didn't. Yeah, I, I might have hardened nerves from, you know, but the, the reality of it's all of, when you're facing retirement, you've been around for a while. Right. And you don't go you don't go through a 40 year uh, lifespan between 20 and 60 without experiencing some bear markets, right? So I've seen enough of them to know. And all through my career, when there was a bear market, I increased my my 401k contributions. You know, I, I automatically said, okay, we're going to take 2% less take home for the next six months because the market's in a bear and we're going to increase our stock, you know, allocation of the 401k. So we have always been a buy the dip type of mentality. So when, when, uh, when COVID came, we actually still had a little bit too much cash. We were still working on getting the buckets totally optimized so that we had a little bit more than the three years of cash. And we said, you know what, let's dump it in the market. And and we, so we were buying in the bear and, and even there we did it kind of intentionally. We said, okay, for every 5% decline in the market, we're going to take 1% of our total net worth and increase it in stocks. And all you're really doing is a rebalancing because your asset allocation in a bear market, your stock allocation is going down. So reallocation rules say you should be moving money into stocks. And that's basically what we did. So we we don't we we never got nervous. We have a couple of years of cash, um, and we just wrote it out. We don't look at the headlines. We don't pay attention to the news. I never look at the market. I, I literally don't. I couldn't tell you. I, I know the market's been on terror right now, but I don't watch it every day. I don't pay attention to headlines. It just it doesn't matter to us. Love it, and I love that you had a formula for that. You know, I've had people kind of, well, yeah, but what if this, what if this? And I'm like, look, we just come up with a formula and we follow the plan. And yeah. that's the best way to do this. You can't go second guessing every day based on the headlines or you know what you think inflation is going to do or the Fed's going to do or the election right. or any of those exactly. things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The importance of having a written plan, right? You should have an investment policy statement that says how yeah. you're going to deal with these things. And, 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 that should have in there, what are you going to do if there's a bear market? Because there will be a bear market and there will be there another will bear be. market and there will be another bear market. You know, we'll probably have three or four more bear markets before we die, right? We live to a Absolutely. normal lifespan. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, moving into some of our less financial topics, the first one I'll call it hybrid because there's a financial element to it. But simplifying is, you know, not all about financial. A lot of it's about administration. And, you know, I, I'm curious, did you simplify when you retired? Did you have less accounts? Did you find yourself consolidating? Yeah, the biggest thing we did, Dana, I was trying to do Roth conversions. We had a 401k and it was a nightmare to do Roth conversions. And I've heard this from other people. We literally had to use snail mail. I would call Vanguard. I'd have to go through voicemail hell to get the, you know, the right person to understand what I was trying to do. And I'm like, this is simple. I'm just trying to do a Roth conversion in my 401k. And it was really frustrating. So I did that for a couple of years. And then to the point of the value of, of a more enjoyable retirement, if you can simplify your life, we, you know, we downsized, we decluttered, we got rid of a bunch of stuff, you know, as well. But on the financial side, we really, the biggest thing we did was we closed the 401k and we moved it into individual IRA and Roth accounts. And now my annual Roth conversion is a click, click on the, on the computer screen. It's done. It's nothing to it. It takes, you know, literally less than five minutes other than determining how much we want to do, obviously. But the, the Roth conversion difficulty was really starting to frustrate me. So that was where we simplified was let's just get rid of it. And, and we have no regrets. And there's some other yeah. reasons we can talk through those. Yeah. 
Yeah, we don't have to talk through them all, but you do. I know you have a blog post called Say Goodbye to the 401k. Yeah. And you must have experienced that frustration and then written that post at the time would be my guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the biggest problem with the 401k too, besides the, the difficulty on the admin side, is they, at least the one that I was in, everybody's got their own plans, but all of your asset allocation is commingled in all of your accounts. So if yes. you just want to, if you just want to do a Roth conversion and sell these stocks, this 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 mutual fund exposure because it's done really well or whatever, you can't. You're going to yep. sell whatever your asset allocation is, equally weighted, boom, and you can't do anything about it. And then we had target date funds, which I, I'll talk about that too. I probably should. That's the other big simplification we did. We had target date funds, which for those that don't know, it's it's uh, asset allocation that automatically rebalances. And as you get closer to retirement, your stocks go down and your bonds go up. Sounds great. And we used them all through my working years. But when you get into retirement, you want to be able to sell stocks or bonds at certain times. And you can't do it with a target date fund because you got to sell them both. So we sold the, we, we closed out the, the target date funds as part of this. We couldn't do it when we had the 401k because everything was blended. So once we closed the 401k, I sold the target date funds, reinvested them in their allocation of bonds and stocks that they already had and now it's just much easier to manage it because we can put the bonds right in the pre-tax we can put the stocks in the Roth and and it's just given us the ability to do that tax location to sell stocks or bonds and so target date funds and 401k were the big two moves that we made on simplification and we started a bond ladder um to your point um because the the bonds and the target date fund are just funds they don't you don't hold them to maturity so we now own specific, you know, maturity target date bonds that, that mature on a certain date and we know we'll get the, the principal back. Love it. You know, there's also an administrative side. We've seen uh, people with up to eight couples with up to 18 accounts between the two of them. Yeah. And when you think about like your retirement paycheck, right, trying to set up direct deposits, change bank accounts, change an address, ch update a beneficiary. Um, with 401ks, they can go through blackout periods where the, the 401k company decides to change providers. We've experienced many 401ks, as you said, where you couldn't specify which asset class you wanted to sell from. It had to be pro rata. So there's all kinds of challenges we've had when you're in this income phase where where the 401ks um, just don't work as well. Yeah. There's now, the one, thing I should, the one thing I should add real quick, sorry, Dana. The one reason that we held off doing that for so long was the 401k does offer the GICs, the Guaranteed Investment Contracts. Yes. which are basically a fixed income it's bond equivalent but it's it's anyway it's a much higher rate than you can get in the market and and yep. until the interest rates came up high enough that we felt comfortable replacing it with a bond ladder i hated to give up that extra yield that you could get in the 401k so that's worth noting that is worth noting matter of fact we have a checklist we use and part of it's a disclosure requirement from the department of labor but we internally go through this checklist before we recommend any 401k rollover and i had a client that had a 457 plan that had one of those guaranteed income contracts and it was there for almost 10 years and just finally this last year we could earn more outside of that guaranteed exactly. income contract exactly. so exactly. and they were getting near rmd age and so there was now a compelling reason to actually roll it over so it's a great yeah. great point you bring up um for those of you already retired required minimum distributions are going to start at 73 or 75 depending on when you were born and there are all kinds of aggregation rules so you know if you have a 401k plan you have to take a separate RMD from each plan. For IRAs, you do not. You could total up the total amount of your IRAs, calculate the RMD, and just take it out from, from one account. Um, 403B plans, you can total all your 403Bs and just take the total, but we've had clients that have a 401k, a 403B, an IRA, and a 457 plan. <clears throat> 457s are like the 401ks. They each have to take their own RMD. And, and none of these can be aggregated and it can be a mess. Like imagine trying to track all of that every year when you're 73 or 75. Yeah. Now there's additional rules around annuities and RMDs that I won't go into. I always do like to note though, we often have people ask if you can combine um, retirement accounts with your spouse and you cannot. So I always like to, to let people know you can't combine IRAs with a spouse, 401ks. 
they have to be individually titled. So moving into what I think is some of the inspirational topics around retirement, you be intentional. Tell us what this means to you. And I think it might have been the inspiration for your blog. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because we spent, you know, a good part of the time talking financials because everybody and, and obviously I'm well versed in it. But you'll find if you read my blog now, I almost never write financial articles anymore because I've recognized and most people have that it's the non-financial stuff that really makes a difference between a successful retirement and, a, you know, we had what it was 10 or 20 percent that were struggling with the retirement. That's that's typically because you miss in this area. So be intentional. Um, if you think about it, it's ultimately you don't have a boss anymore. It's your responsibility to have a great retirement. And that doesn't just happen by chance. It might. But we made a conscious decision probably a year before retirement. We kind of did all the financial stuff. We had about a year to go. So we were just waiting for the numbers. And we really started focusing on the non-financial. And I wrote a, a post right before I retired called The Ten Commandments of Retirement, just as an example of how to be intentional. And it was kind of my guide of here are the things that I want my retirement to be. And it was mainly around mindset, you know, be have an attitude of gratitude, um, be charitable. Um, it, it, a lot of it was mindset related, be curious. Um, and and the, the importance of spending time thinking about how are you going to drive your successful retirement? Um, what interests you? You know, I mentioned starting my blog. That was, a, that was an experiment. That was a curiosity thing. That was being intentional. It was starting to explore things several years before I retired, all with the goal of, of trying to develop a great life. And, and I think about being intentional. I, I've used this analogy that your life is like a wheel and you've got spokes in your wheel, right? You've got your money, you've got your relationships, you've got, you know, your charity, you've got a lot of different spokes. You should think about each one of those spokes and how you can, number one, make sure they're all about the same length, right? Because a wheel rolls better that way. So retirement at the time, you can invest in those folks, maybe relationships where you've been too busy working, you haven't been able to spend time with the kids. Well, guess what? You're retired now. We bought a second home down near Alabama and we're, we're spending time down there with our daughter and granddaughter a week every month. Be intentional with every spoke. And then the last thing I'll mention on it is I, I look at once you get into retirement, it, it's kind of like a hand of cards. And you can pick up any card you want. You can put down any card you want. And you're constantly trying to improve your hand. So never be afraid to try picking up a new card for a while and never be afraid to put down a card if it's not giving you the best fulfillment. Those are the types of things when I talk about being intentional, it's, it's that type of thinking that you should apply into your retirement plan. I love it. And I think I remember you saying, did you do a kind of a test run for retirement? We did. Yep. How did um, you we, do we, that? We it was uh, eight months before retirement, and basically it's not like we quit my job and we retired for six months. We 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 couldn't do that, obviously. So just over Thanksgiving break, we took an extra week. We came up to the cabin. We were still living in the city, and we said, "Look, let's just kind of think about." It, it wasn't, you know, it was what do we want our retirement to be? And it wasn't, oh, it's Tuesday, let's go kayaking. It wasn't activity focused. It was more around this type of stuff. So we we spent ten days in the mountains you know, nice dinners out talking about this stuff. What do we want to do? How much time do you want for your stuff? How much time do I want for my stuff? How much time do we want to do stuff together, right? It was relationship focused. It was um, hobbies. It was interests. It was, you know, dreams. Taking some time to get away from the workplace in your last year of work and try to clear your head to think about that kind of stuff really helps. I love it. So, you know, it's it's great. And it sounds like you had just some really fantastic conversations with your spouse so you two could collaborate on the process. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know you have a, a blog post. You wanted to give credit to Wes Moss's book, What the Happiest Retirees Know, 10 Habits for a, a Healthy, Secure, and Joyful Life, where you talk about the six non-financial traits. Um, we've talked about the effort spent on retirement and, you know, he identifies retiring at our planned time, which we would all aspire to. Uh, I know Forbes has an article that says 56% of retirees retire earlier than they expect. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not always something within our control. I do think if you've done the planning, it makes it a lot easier to adjust if, if you are, aren't able to work until you had planned. 
But let's talk about some of these, you know, curiosity, I believe was on your 10 commandments, um, personal health. I have a slide we'll talk about, yeah. you know, how, how have you approached some of these other aspects? Yeah, it, really, if you look at this, everyone except number two is within your control, right? So these are all things that you can control. You can't, you can't blame somebody else because you didn't do them. These are all things that you can do within your control. And these are all, I, I, I'll tell you the backstory. It's kind of interesting. The article, the article with why 70 was 76% of uh, retirees were happy, whatever it was. That the story behind that, I, I initially wrote the first article was why 24% of retirees aren't happy, you know, are unhappy. And one of my readers wrote back and said, "Well, what about the 75% that are?" I was like, "Okay, good point." He goes, "You got to write another post." So I wrote another post. As I was doing research on it, I came across Wes Moss, who we all know anyway. But um, but the important thing is, look at the people that are having successful retirements and figure out what you can replicate from. And the other thing I did, right before I retired, I, I started asking like 80-year-old people that looked like they were having a good retirement. I said, look, I'm going to retire in about six months. What's the one piece of advice you give me to have a successful retirement? None of those answers focused on money. They were all on this kind of stuff. Once you get into retirement, this is where you focus. This is where you realize these things matter. So things like curiosity. You know, try new things. Hey, I might like to write. I'm going to start a blog. Be willing to take a first step in any area that you're curious about. And if you do it enough, you're going to find two or three or four things that really click. And happy retirees have like three and a half, four pursuits. Unhappy retirees have less than two, right? How do you find those four pursuits? By being curious and exploring things. Social connections. Don't, don't, you know, you're going to lose all your friends from work. Think about all those things you get from work besides the paycheck. It's a long list, right? It's relationships, it's a sense of purpose, it's structure to your day, it's it's all those things. And spend time thinking about how you're going to replace each one of those. Social connections is one of those, right? You used to have a, a natural social connection at work that's going to be gone the day you retire. How are you going to replace it? So start being intentional at developing relationships that will live into your retirement. Personal health is another one. You know, you don't just want to live until you're old. You want to live well. Peter Atia talks about, oh, there we go. Um, Peter Atia talks about lifespan, right? Lifespan is being able to do the things you want to do in your in your 70s or 80s. So I make a huge focus on fitness. I was out there to see Dana a couple, what, two months ago, I guess. And I'm like, hey, I'm here, I got to go camelback. So I, you know, I, I sent her that picture. She's like, oh, we got to use this for a webinar. Um, you know, if I get an opportunity when I'm traveling somewhere, absolutely. I'll go out for a run. I'll go climb a mountain. You know, I, I am very, again, intentional. I structure uh, today. I did an hour and a half workout today before the call. And, you know, I, I I do weights, I do cardio, I do flexibility. Focusing on wellness is is as important as focusing on your finances, because what good is your money if you're not able to get out and do things that you enjoy with it? So finance or personal fitness is a huge area to me of a successful retirement, because guess what? You've now got the time to focus on it. So do it. Set up a structure. Get out there and do it. And your life, you know, I, I feel better now than I've felt my whole life. And, and you know, we're out building fences with my wife's charity. I'm working out. I feel, I feel absolutely wonderful. And it's because I've been intentional for the last, you know, five years on carving out time to improve my fitness. So everybody should yeah. do it. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. So I know, you know, Fritz, uh, it was the first time we actually got to meet was here a few months ago. And then the next day you text me this picture just for our audience. This is not a short walk from where he took this picture to even the base of this mountain. And Camelback is a hard hike. And I was so I, I was like, wow, like that's amazing. That is not, um, not easy. Um, I love what I you said. I swim, I do all kinds of fitness stuff. You know, again, variety is a spice of life. I, I'll do long distance swimming and mountain biking and hiking and yeah, anyway, mix it up. I think, yeah, is your cabin on a lake or near a lake? No, but there's a, there's a really nice lake nearby. We're in the mountains, we're in Blue Ridge, Georgia, right at the, where the Appalachian Trail starts and there's some really beautiful Alpine lakes up here. So I, I swim, you know, April through, I, I do cold water swimming as well. So I'll probably get in the water next week or two. I, I get in. Once it gets above 55, I'll get in and uh, I'll swim until it gets back to 55 in the fall. So, Wow. Yeah, I, I remember reading one of your posts I, or it might have been Twitter. I'm not sure, but uh, you had just done a swim and I was thinking, where? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. You know, and I also love what you said about, you know, being in your 80s or, you know, 90s. I It's interesting. I have a family member who at 
uh, was out maybe last year, the year before. And she said to me something about, I mentioned skiing and she's, well, how, how long do you want to ski? And I was like, well, as long as I can, <laughs> you know, and her mindset was kind of like, well, you know, you won't be able to do that much longer. Like, you know, once you get to be 50 or 55, like that's it. And it just really shook me up because I was thinking that's not my mindset at all. Like I want to hike and I want to do all of these things as long as I can. And that's yeah. not going to happen unless I'm intentional every day about moving my body and being healthy. That's right. The, the one book I'd recommend because it does address skiing is Younger Next Year. It was a big hit well, a couple of years back. Younger Next Year was written by a doctor who focused on longevity and one of his clients patients and his patient was 72 years old and still silky and black diamonds and veil so he, he he talks about the medical realities of, of focusing on fitness and then he and then he shows a real life example so it's it's medical and whatever retirement lifestyle intermingled right. it's younger next year I strongly younger recommend. next year is the book it'll, okay it'll motivate you to stay in shape i love it now, you also have a post, The Four Phases of Retirement, which I believe is um, based on a book by, am I not sure if I'm saying it right, Riley Moines? Correct, yep. Yep. And here's where in, in your blog post, you mentioned, you know, there's these four phases and this phase two, loss and loss. And you said, let's talk to the 85 to 90% who get stuck in phase two. And this could possibly be that 10% who answered our survey that they're retired and, you know, maybe they're yeah. not feeling it. Talk a little bit to this. Yeah, and, and I, I've, I've always thought about these phases. I waited until I was five years into retirement to write it because I really want to make sure I could speak from experience. And Riley, he has a, a TED talk, actually, TEDx that he did on the book that went viral, you know, a couple million views. But the problem with everybody goes to phase one. We get that. That's fine. Um, lasts about a year, 18 months, typically. Um, and 85% and hit phase two. 10 to 15% jump it. I jumped it. And, and I attribute all the planning that I did in advance, I jumped right to phase four. I never even hit phase three, really, because I was doing that while I was still working. But phase two is the real danger zone. And what he talks about in phase two is it, you, you lose the big five. And, and again, none of these are about money, Dana. That's the thing. This is why the non-financial stuff matters. People get stuck. They get depressed. They have a tough time in phase two, and it's typically not because of financial. So the big five, think back to what I said earlier about Think of all those things you get from work that you're going to lose on the day you retire and try to think of a way to replace them. That's why I skipped phase two, because phase two is all about recognizing those things you lost in work beyond the paycheck. So if the big five are your routine, the structure of your day, your sense of identity, your relationships. We already talked about that. Your sense of purpose, because you, you, know, you had a reason for being. You had objectives. You were working on stuff. And for some people, the sense of power, you know, you, you had privilege when you went to the airport, you were a million miles or what now you're not right. So losing those big five at the same time, you're dealing with the three D's. He calls them gray divorce. Divorce is a big problem. When people first retire depression and decline, physical decline. So all eight of those things are happening at the same time. And if you have not thought about the non-financial stuff and this stuff just hits you blind, it is really disorienting and it can be very hard to get out of. So how do you get out of it? Is you've got to decide, back to this point about being intentional, your boss isn't around anymore. You know, you maybe you have a spouse, maybe she's telling you or he's telling you, hey, get off the couch and go do stuff. It's not the same, right? You've got to make your conscious decision that I've got to change my life because I do not like where I'm at right now. And once you make that decision, you're on your way to phase three. And phase three is when you start experimenting, you know, with with that's the curiosity piece we talked about earlier. If something intrigues you, start exploring it and go that way. Listen to what you're interested in, be introspective, and have the courage to take a couple steps in that direction. And that's how you get out of it. And that's how you find real, real happiness. And phase, phase four is when you really find those things. And only about 60, 50 to 65% of retirees actually make it to phase four. Phase four, um, Riley says, these are the, um, I actually wrote down, so I thought it was great. These are the happiest, most satisfied people I've ever met. And we did a survey. I, I did it with uh, Eric Weagle on blind spots in retirement. And the happiest group in the whole sample were people that had been retired two years or more. Guess what? They kind of moved through these phases and they kind of achieved 
they they found those things that were starting to bring them excitement and enjoyment. You know, mine is fitness and my blog and my wife's charity we'll talk about in a minute. But finding those things that really give you excitement, that's the key to phase four. But you've got to do it yourself. And it's not a it's not a it's not a skill that we've developed, right? When you're in the corporate world or working for a living, it's 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 more structured. You're not able to be free and artistic and explore. So it takes a while to learn how to do that. It's kind of going back to kindergarten when you were free to play and, and look at stuff. And that's the skill you've got to develop to get through these phases. It's a great, it's a great uh, concept. Yeah, it really is. And it's interesting, you know, as you said, we're not really taught how to do this. I remember a few years ago, I had been asked the question of what brings you joy? And I was felt like a deer in the headlights. And so I have, have done a lot of work and still am doing the work on just paying attention to what I feel in my body. And so I was talking to my husband the other night about something and I was like, when I see this, I start to vibrate at a higher level. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to, to find those things that bring us joy and purpose. And, and yeah. like you said, that trial and error is like, how do you know? Well, you got to pay attention to like, it might not make any sense, right? You yeah. might just like something and find that you feel like it, you feel lighter. You know, for me, it might feel like a higher vibration for someone else. It might just feel like you have more energy. It might feel like a weight is lifted or you just feel lighter, but it's paying attention to your body and, and what you're drawn to. And I, I think that can make a big difference, uh, but you yeah, got to get out there. And, you know, yeah. I think people struggle with, especially the more analytical side, which the, the financial side is all analytical. This is the exact yeah. opposite of that. And you can't just pull out a spreadsheet and say, do this, add this, do that. It, it's, it's, a, it's an iterative process. It's really hard to explain. It takes some time to figure out how you're going to do it. And it'll lead, where you, it'll lead you places you don't expect, right? I, if I think of the yeah. things I'm doing now that really I love in my retirement, you know, this, this building I'm in, this, this is a woodworking shop that I built after I retired. I, I didn't do woodworking when I was working, right? This, this I never saw it. If you would have asked me to put together a bucket list of what is going to get me excited in retirement, it wouldn't have even been on the list. I could have had 50 items that wouldn't have been on the list. I found it through exploration, you know, and, and I could give you half a dozen examples like that of things that I'm really enjoying now that I would not have told you about a year or two before I retired because you can't know this stuff. The only way to yeah. do it is phase three. You've got to do the trial and error. Yeah. Well, I feel so grateful to have my head into this content now because I, I know I would be one of those people who could be at significant risk of getting stuck in phase two because I love what I do and I have so much sense of purpose from it. And, you know, it's been just just the coolest thing ever to be able to build an organization. And so, um, you know, I although I'm far away, I actually think about this quite a bit because I Good. know for me, there's going to be a lot of work for me to do in those phases. Yep. Yep. Talking about purpose, that's where our fifth key and possibly most important key is. And I know, as you said, you kind of stumbled upon this by accident. But tell us a, a little bit, you had mentioned your wife and what she went through after her mom died and, and how you yeah. two ended up finding something that mattered. Yeah, and, and this is kind of how things lead that you, you don't expect. And, and uh, I, I, you know, one thing we talked about, hey, you know, my wife and I had a lot of discussions about this stuff. We're, we're, we're not perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. And we missed, we missed a big one. And the big one that we missed was my wife, um, she was a stay-at-home mom. After, after our daughter was born, she stayed home. And then when our daughter was in high school, her mom moved in with us. She had Alzheimer's. So my wife became a full-time caregiver for her, even after our wife left, my, our daughter left. And um, my, you know, of course we knew she was going to die at some point. So in our retirement, we're like, well, okay, we'll probably not be able to travel too much until, you know, mom's gone and, you know, we'll do what we got to do for mom, obviously. Um, and then three months after I retired, mom died. And my wife, it, it, it's almost like, person who's like you just talked about you love your job you know she she really enjoyed taking care of her mom it's hard obviously anybody that's dealt with alzheimer's knows knows what's about but you feel like you're doing the right thing giving back to your parents you know blah 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 so she 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 was passionate about it she enjoyed it um and then it was gone and she hadn't really recognized nor had i that really that was her job and suddenly her job was gone and we hadn't done any planning on all these non-financial things of how was she gonna replace those elements that she got from the caregiving. 
And she went into a little bit of a, you know, phase two type of thing. Not real long, probably four or five months. And then she happened, she started to do the experimentation phase three. She saw a video of, uh, of uh, Mike Rowe, the guy that does dirty jobs. He has a returning the favor program that he was doing a profile on a charity out in Oregon called Fences for Fido. And they built three fences for low income families with dogs on chains in Oregon. And my wife's like, we should do that here. And I was like, absolutely, you know, and she just, you could see, I mean, it was just like your vibration thing. It just, it, she's always been a dog person. It was, it was like, it was such a cool moment. We didn't know how to build a fence. We didn't know how to run a charity. Five years later, we've got a, you know, 501c3, we're building, we built a fence yesterday. We're expanding to the town next door. We're, we're expanding. We've got a big fundraiser coming up. We've got 200 volunteers involved. We, we've built 125 fences. We've freed over 300 dogs. We've got a sense of community because we call it the Fido family. All these volunteers who also love this, by the way, because they're in phase three, they're trying to find stuff to do. A lot of retirees in this area. They come to build, they're like, man, this is great. My wife's like, we don't talk politics. We keep it fun. We joke around. Nobody get offended if we're making jokes. That's how we That's how we do Fido builds, right? So it's always joking. It's always laughter. Somebody will shoot a text out on a Thursday night and say, hey, y'all want to go to Grumpy's tomorrow night? It's a little microbrew. And we'll have like 20 or 30 of us show up, you know, just stuff like that. We got a, we got a, um, we do a birthday party every year. It's Saturday night. So two nights from now. And my wife said, I want to do this for the, for the volunteers. We started this in year two. My wife and I do all the work. We get it catered. We have a big party. And, uh, and she, I, I spray paint tea posts. We paint them gold. And she does a Golden Tea Post Award, and they're a riot. I mean, she makes them totally humorous, right? So we do a Golden Tea Post Award. So it's that sense of community, that sense of relationship, that sense of giving back, that sense of purpose. Man, we're on fire for this. And it all came about because she saw a video and said we should do it, and we took the first step. That's how you find it. I love it. And, you know, you also had set the mindset with your Ten Commandments. We're going to be open. We're going to be curious. Yeah. We're going to be charitable. So when that came along, you'd already, you know, kind of agreed that you were going to have this mindset. So I think that made it easier to say, hey, let's take a look at this and, and give it yeah. a go. That's yeah. just absolutely amazing. And I know um, I'm a fellow dog person. You have a blog, a post called, uh, I think it's Seven Secrets to a Great Retirement. And yeah. one of them, I think it's secret number seven, is have yeah. a furry friend. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny, but and a lot of you all, you're either a dog person or you're not. That's fine. You know, but there are benefits to having a dog, right? You're going to get out and do a walk. It, guess what? It's a relationship. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a canine instead of a human. But, you know, they, there is a relationship there, right? So you get exercise, you get relationship, you get anyway. Yeah, the dogs, we, we're, we're big dog people. Now, you have four right now. Is that right? Four dogs? Uh oh. Oh, well, for some reason, Fritz, your sound just went out. We could hear you most of the time, um, but doesn't look like you're muted. So we're going to give it a few minutes. I'm pretty sure Fritz has four dogs. And if for some reason his sound doesn't come back, we will actually, we'll give it a, a minute. I think it probably will. We actually were wrapping up. <laughs> so. That brought us to the end of our formal presentation, and we thank you're back. All right, Sorry. tell us four dogs is where I was. We had four dogs, unfortunately, Dana. We've lost two of them in the last four months. We've had a tough, oh. tough four months, so we're down to two. We're fostering a little bit, so we we were up to three for a little while. But yeah, we're we're down to two dogs, unfortunately. So yeah, now, but we had four dogs. Have talking about the benefits of dogs now i've just got to ask because you mentioned you you go for a week i think to is it atlanta or alabama, alabama. where your alabama where your your daughter lives so do the dogs go with you absolutely even when we when we did our three-month rv trip to the pacific northwest all the dogs go camping with us you know we had four dogs in the back of my truck it's an f-250 so you know crew cab we got a little cargo net. They sit in the back seat. We put the seat down, put a bunch of dog seats back there. They, they went all the way up to the West Coast with us. So our dogs have wow. been in both oceans. How many people can say their dogs have been in both oceans? That's kind of cool. Not many. Those are lucky Not dogs. Many. I know I have a client. They really want to do an extended trip to Italy, but they have an older dog and they just, they're like, not until 
you know, not until he's gone because so, yeah. so I, it can be a benefit. It can also in some, some ways change your plans, which yeah. any dog lover understands and any non dog down. lover probably thinks we're crazy. And we also have a great dog sitter. So when we're doing our big trip, we got a trip coming up to Williamsburg and, and the Maryland coast in DC and Shenandoah Valley. We're not going to take the dogs for that one. This is our first trip since retirement without the dogs. We're like, yeah, we'll have our dogs that are coming. This is just for my wife and I, nice little yeah. intimate Airbnb. It's kind of a special get together for just us. So, you know, you got to mix it up, but yeah, they do, yeah. they do constrain your travel a little bit, no doubt. They do. Well, opening it up to Q and A, as those of us that have attended one of our webinars before, we try to stay on and, and we have a thing that says no question unanswered. We are gonna cap it to, a, a, it's about 45 minutes from now. So I'm here in Arizona, Fritz is on the East Coast. So while it's 6.15 here, it is 9.15 PM there. And so we do wanna open it up to Q&A. Nancy's gonna come back on. And as you post questions into the, the question box, they can be financial, they can be non-financial. We absolutely love hearing the questions from the audience, so don't be shy. And, and we're gonna open it up. And Nancy, were there any questions that, that came in that during the webinar that you wanna start with? Yes, there, there were a few. Uh, so first is, what are your recommendations on a withdrawal strategy, i.e. 4%, guardrail, et cetera? Well, I will um, say there is a second handout you can download called Don't Cheat Yourself with the 4% Rule. It talks about um, some of the pitfalls of following a specific rule. I know I'm a plan of probably what would be more considered the guardrail strategy. So rather than having an exact calculation and a percentage, um, you know, you would would use some kind of a guardrail and you have to run it out personally. My problem with the rules of thumb is they don't take into account the individual things that may apply to your situation. Fritz, I saw you raise your hand. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you on the guardrail. Yeah, the, the, the thing I would say is, you know, there's been a lot of press in the last little while that three and a half is kind of the new 4%. And, you know, with the, with the lower expected returns, higher stock valuations, blah, 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 you know, three and a half is probably safer. The way we did it is we said, let's start, again, I'm a conservative investor. Let's start like three and a quarter to three and a half. That'll be our baseline plan for retirement. And then every year we do the net worth. And what we do is we run 3%, three and a half and 4% against our spendable assets. So even if the market's gone down, but we still, we don't want to cut our spending that much, we can go up to four. You know, we could go up to four and a half for a year or two, no problem. Um, we look at that and we say it's, it's more of a guardrail. And the guardrail to me is making sure 4% says you start it and you just increase it from inflation. You never look at it. That's, that to me is not, doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. We look at it relative to our annual net worth and how that's changing and make spending decisions based on that. And the other thing is, when you're planning your spending in retirement, don't just retire as soon as you can cover all your necessities. Make sure you've got some buffer in there for the luxuries in life, because if you do get into a situation where the markets are down for an extended period of time, you can cut out some of the luxuries and you're still covering you know, the, the necessities and you're probably still not gonna be over four or 5%. So that's kind of how we look at it as we annually adjust based on how the market's doing, but we try to keep between three and a quarter and 4%. Yeah, and I, um, you know, the report that that's downloadable called Don't Cheat Yourself with the 4% Rule might sound like we're trying to get people to spend a lot more than that. But one of the challenges I have with the 4% Rule is we use a metric called a fundedness ratio that really is like the 4% Rule over life. And oftentimes people can retire earlier than they thought or do some extras during their go-go years. You know, we have clients that might have an 8% withdrawal rate one year or five or 6% for several years, but yeah. then because of social security or a pension beginning later, it tapers off to be, you know, 3% for, for the tail end of their retirement. And so my challenge is, you know, if you're following a rule that's just 4%, there might be things that are completely realistic when viewing that spending over your lifetime and 8% and or 9% in, in one year not every year but could be completely achievable and sometimes i think that can hold people back from from doing some things whether that be purchasing an rv or taking a you know wish list vacation things like that Spot on. i agree yep 
do the taxes owed from some of the retirement account withdrawals get counted in the outlays section? Uh, for our planning, yes, absolutely. If we were to go back and um, let me just see if I can actually show you and go back real quick, we'll speed click. So here um, we see federal taxes. There's some self-employment taxes because of the deferred comp plan, net investment income tax as part of these outflows on our complex plan. And if we go to our simple plan, again, you're going to see this was a, a no uh, state tax location, but you're going to see federal taxes. So we absolutely include that in outflows and it's calculated based on the specific type of income. So if somebody had a lot more money in 401ks, the taxes are going to look completely different than someone who had all their money in, you know, a trust brokerage account. Yeah, and I'm the same way. You have to pay. And, and Dana, actually, I don't think I've ever mentioned this to you, but the biggest takeaway I got from your book was the importance of taxes because um, it's so easy to just think about your spending and, okay, my taxes are kind of coming out of my paycheck now, so I just spend after tax. And you just kind of okay i'm not sure how that's going to work out in retirement man it, it's it's you've got to get the tax piece you've got to factor it in especially if you've got a lot of free we had um 60 of our retirement accounts were pre-tax ira 401k so we knew we were going to have a huge tax obligation to get that out so we now have a spending line for taxes thanks to you and we calculate it based on how much we even back when 2015 when i was putting this together how much are we going to be doing conversions let's make sure we factor that up by the tax rate so yeah, you got to pack your taxes in. Yeah, you just reminded me of a story. So we had a, a client hire us. He was actually a <clears throat> had a certified financial planner designation and had worked at Fidelity for years, but not in a planning capacity. So, you know, to his credit, he wasn't doing planning. He, you know, was in a product role or an executive role. I can't remember. But he said, You're not gonna believe this, Dana. I know I, I have a C my CFP. I retired. And I just always use the 4% rule, but I forgot about taxes. Like he just forgot and had most of his money in pre-retirement and just forgot about that was going to take 25%, you know, of, of the amount he had planned to withdraw. And so it is, it's easy to miss and, and to, to estimate it inaccurately. A oh, question about software. What software should I use to manage cash, income, and growth? Do you have any software um, you use, Fritz? I, I use spreadsheets. I, I, like I said, when, when I, when you, we'll let you touch on it too, Dana, but I, I will I will put a plug in, um, not to, but for DIYers out there, there's some really good retirement calculators as well. Um, new Retirement comes to mind, um, Empower has some, but New Retirement is probably the most robust in terms of modeling Roth conversions, but it's not easy. I mean, you got to spend some time with the models. Um, but for me, I just use spreadsheets and we actually do the same for estimating our quarterly estimated taxes. Again, I'm very comfortable with spreadsheets. I'm a spreadsheet geek like Dana. I, I'm comfortable doing a spreadsheet, but you can do an off the market model like a new retirement if you want to do it yourself. And Dana, you can address how you guys do it. You know, we um, built our own model and so we're big on spreadsheets. You know, the actual portfolios that we manage for clients, it's run through rebalancing software that, you know, professional firms subscribe to. The particular one we use is Tamarack for those professionals out there. Um, but I was going to say the same for do-it-yourselfers. I'm a, I'm a fan of New Retirement, so you can go to newretirement.com. I think it's a, a fabulous tool. I've known the founder, Stephen Chen, um, for over a decade, and we dialogue, you know, see each other at conferences, and I, I've always been a fan of what he was building there, and every year it continues to improve. Yeah. I don't know if this is a question, but I, Dana, this makes me smile. Someone said, what if spreadsheets give me joy? <laughs> <laughs> you found your purpose. That's okay. <laughs> she gave uh, me joy. So I understand. They always have. I, I, I don't know, know what. Uh, um, question about RMDs and aggregation. I thought the new rules for 401k were that RMDs can now be aggregated, and I'm assuming it's just it's related to 401ks. I don't think so. Um, I don't think so, but we will look it up and offer a question in the comments, um, you know, when we post this, if, if we're wrong. Now, one of the things they did change or clarify was some of the rules on annuities and how uh, an RMD from an annuity is treated. 
and and so you know we can can add those rules to the comment but i don't i don't believe the 401k aggregation rules changed 403Bs can be aggregated with other 403Bs. 401Ks have to, my understanding is 401Ks have to each have their own RMDs. Yeah, and um, I had I, just looked this up um, on the IRS website very recently. So I just, nothing I came across said that had changed. Yeah. Um, Fritz, this is for you. Have you done uh, a lot of planning for your wife if the situation were to arise so that she can manage uh, her retirement alone? Great question. Um, we talk about it a lot. She does not like the financials. She doesn't want to get involved with it. She just wants to know that we're okay, right? She knows I'm 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 competent on this. She has total faith in me. I I, I share obviously everything we're doing in our net worth statement. So what do you do, right? It's a it's a common problem. So basically, what we've what we've agreed every year, I write a love letter, which everybody should do. That's in case of emergency, might be another way to think about it. And I print out our latest net worth statement. And I've got a letter that goes on the front of that with step-by-step -step instruction. Call your brother, have him come down and read this letter with you. Step two, you know, and, and I walk it through. And what I've told her to do is, I, I won't make a recommendation because I don't, I don't think, but I, I've basically said, yes, hire somebody to do it. Um, and here's the people that I would suggest. Um, and basically that's, that's kind of, if I get hit by a bus initially, the second thing we're thinking about is, even though I like doing this stuff, I also recognize there's a risk of cognitive decline in time. So I'm kind of in my mind somewhere maybe in my mid-70s at the latest, you know, maybe early 70s. Even if I still have a passion for this stuff, out of respect for her, knowing that the guy normally dies before the woman, um, I'm probably going to go ahead and migrate ours out to an asset under management, some type of structure where I'll have a professional that takes care of it. She can be involved. Now, my dad passed away recently, and he had a financial advisor. So we've intentionally kept those assets with that financial advisor as a bit of a test. And I told my wife, look, we've got a guy. You know, you can use him, but here's some other things. You know, if you're not comfortable with him, but, you know. So we've got some short-term, some mitigation short-term, and then kind of a long-term ultimate plan. It's definitely something everybody has to think about. I'm sure, Dana, you've seen stories, right? Same with, by the way, passwords, right? My, my love letter has passwords. How do, you, how do you get into our password manager? How do you get onto my computers? How do you unlock my phone, right? All those types of things you've got to have documented somewhere where your spouse knows where they are. Yeah, yeah, I've, we've had many, many people over the years tell us, you know, who are completely capable of doing their own planning or enjoyed it, or maybe they didn't quite have the joy, um, but um, they said, you know, I'm, we're hiring you because of my spouse. And it can go either direction, right? I know it's, it's still more common to see, um, you know, the female be the one that's less interested in finances. But um, in my case, my spouse is the one less interested and I have, we've seen many clients the same, right? It can go either way um, that one spouse just has no interest. And, and so they will often hire someone. Sometimes we just have one person that shows up for the meetings and the instructions to the other person are, something happens to me, call them. <laughs> And unfortunately, we, you know, we've we've stepped in and I should say, fortunately, actually, we've been able yeah. to step in when those things have happened and take over seamlessly. And it, it definitely has made it a lot easier for that person. A uh, question here is that uh, my quandary is, is that each financial site I use to plan retirement income out to 92 comes up with very different results as to viability. Examples are newretirement.com, personal capital, now empower retirement income planning tool, Wade Fow and RISA funded ratio. Who slash what do I believe? Some I'm overfunded, some I'm way underfunded, and none of them handle a sale of a house to buy into a CCRC to cover LTC, long-term care. I I feel your pain. So yeah. long ago, I had a, a blog post when I was writing for about.com. You know, I, I wrote as their money over 55 expert. And I did a case where I would put the same case into several different publicly available software and just like you would get different answers. And so we tried to document some of the differences. Unfortunately, there's no way we can tell you who to believe 
um, because I, you know, it depends on the underlying assumptions. Some accounts, some pr plans accurately tax things. Um, some do not. Some have certain assumptions around growth rates and assets. Some you set your own assumptions. There can be all kinds of, of things happening. I know in our process, you know, the assumptions we use are very well documented. There's, there's a rationale behind them. We use a 5% growth rate on portfolios. We use 3% inflation on living expenses. We use 5% inflation on healthcare related expenses. And we use three different retirement readiness tests. So one is a fundedness test. Um, we use a Monte Carlo analysis, and then we use something called a critical path. And so we test it in three different ways because you know, similar to what you're describing, you know, we want to look at it in various ways and make sure all of these tests are, are coming back in the passing ratio. So I wish we could answer that question, but without looking and, and it would take literally, you know, far more than 20 hours to try to dig into the assumptions under each um, various planning model and trying to understand what they're, what they're using behind the scenes. Part of the reason we build our own planning model was because even the, the, programs available for financial planners often wouldn't allow us to do some of the things like sell your house to cover you know a continuing care community like it wouldn't allow us to model some of these things in and we would also find cases particularly when it came to taxes where we often work with very sophisticated clients and they would want to know like well, where did this number come from and it was we called it the black box when you're looking at yeah. software we're like oh gosh you know how do you figure that out and so we ended up building our, our own model because we can easily answer those questions and figure out what each number came from and model out anything um that sometimes the software just doesn't allow you to do and I'll touch on it real quick there's the DIYs, exactly the same same situation. And that's why I did the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is my own model, right? I know what's in there. I know the inflation assumptions. I know the return assumptions. I know the tax assumptions. And then what I did is I, I ran that and I'd run two or three different retirement calculators and I'd kind of compare the results to make sure I wasn't grossly missing something. And, you know, I'd say, okay, they're kind of, you know, I'm, but I ultimately trusted my spreadsheet because I knew what was behind it. The black box syndrome is very real. And the other thing I should say is new retirement is very good, but um, I actually did a case study. I, I wrote a blog post about it and we, it was with Steve, Steve Chen agreed to do this as part of the, the case study. We had the client use new retirement. I presented everything on my blog. I did a spreadsheet. I presented everything on my blog and we got a one-on-one -on -one time with one of their professionals who walked us through how you can change their assumptions inside the black box made a huge difference on, on which scenario. And if you're just looking at five different withdrawal strategies and you click one, you don't know what that does, but just clicking those different ones can make a huge impact. You've got to get into the guts of it. If, you know, that's why I prefer a spreadsheet. I made my own model like you did, Dana. Yep. A, qu a question I think for for everyone on the, uh, the webinar here, um, participants, or uh, I'm sorry, but, a participant, not not you guys, uh, the the people watching. Um, will we have a replay of the webinar? Yes. Uh, and and the comment is, I would like my spouse to see it. So I, I think that's great. Um, question on annuities. So do you have input preference on the use of annuities in retirement? You want me to address it first, and you can, Dana, as more professional. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Um, I've got a pension, fortunately, so I don't have annuities. But if you think about longevity risk and what levers you can pull, basically you can delay Social Security. That's a longevity play. Um, you can buy annuities. I mean, those are your best longevity bet. And now with the interest rates being up, they're much more attractive than they were when I first retired. So I'm starting to think about one, even though I've got a pension, mainly because my pension drops. When I die, you know, we got a survivor clause, so my wife gets, I don't know, 67% or whatever it is. So we're thinking about potentially layering in an annuity, maybe a deferred, don't have to get into the specifics of it. But if you look at the annuity payouts, you know, we talked about the 4% safe withdrawal rate. With annuities, you're actually getting about a 5% spend rate that you can do right now with these interest rates. They're not bad. And because it's pooling everybody's longevity risk together, yeah, if you die early, you lose. But the people that die late, they win because of those people that died early. So it, it, there is a benefit 
that you can't achieve in any other way besides an annuity, and especially now with interest rates being up. We're starting to think about it. I don't have one, but Dana, you're, I'll throw it to you. Well, the interesting thing is on our last webinar, um, somebody mentioned to me, how come you never bring up annuities? So our next webinar is going to be on June 13th, and it's actually on annuities. So that's what's really funny. Um, we're going to be talking specifically around, you know, how we evaluate them, what they're good for, you know, how, how, how do you build a framework around this? But I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, we don't sell annuities. We are not advisors that are compensated by the sale, but we do have a way of analyzing them. And because of the change in interest rates this last year, I know, you know, I was involved in three client cases where we did place a, a portion of someone's assets into annuities. And we have a way of measuring how it impacts the plan. And, you know, again, for people that have no pensions, you know, we look at it in terms of how much of their expenses are covered by guaranteed income. And if that ratio is under 50 percent it can make sense to have a conversation and at least look at how an annuity might impact the plan and, and so i think they're always worth evaluating that's my answer there are certainly um cases where the client has so much in assets you know they're going to be fine and, and there wouldn't be a need for it there's also cases where just peace of mind you know having that extra guaranteed income uh, helps people sleep at night and, and makes them feel better about their plan and may allow them to take more risk with uh, other portions of their assets. So I am a fan of, as, as our listeners usually know, of everything's a tool. It's a matter of just being open-minded, deciding if the tool fits your situation. If it doesn't, that's fine. Um, but, but don't just automatically rule things out. Some people say that the payoff of a Roth conversion doesn't occur for 25 to 35 to 25 to 30 years, uh, and they're against conversions. How do you forecast or plan your Roth conversions? Do you do them uh, one time a year? Do you plan a few years at a time? If the latter, what percentage do you use to inflate income of tax brackets for future years? Or would it be better to use software like New Retirement? Uh, to plan for Roth conversions. Well, let me touch on it first, Dana, and then you can do the, yep. the, the more expert view. Um, you, you never know the future, right? So I always look at the current, and, and if you look at the, the tax rates that came in in 2018, they're hugely favorable for joint filed, for married filed jointly, tremendous reductions in the tax rates, especially in that 150 to $300,000 income range. Um, so, what does that mean? That means you've got to, those potentially expire at the end of 2025. So there is a, in my mind, you're at pretty, pretty tough to beat marginal tax rates up to the 24% bracket at least. And I'm taking full advantage of it. I, I wrote an article called, is this the golden age of Roth conversions? And, I, and I'm doing full Roth conversions up to the top of 24% because I don't know what the future is going to be. Maybe I'll be wrong, but I, I view Everybody's got to take a view on the future tax rates, and nobody knows. You've got to make your own decision, and I don't think Dana can probably give any guidance on what they're going to be. Um, but my feeling is they probably can't get much lower than they are now, and they can certainly get a lot higher. So take some now, take some later, but that's how I look at it. Yeah, and, you know, we um... – run it out in our model that is taxing it's basically doing a 1040 tax calculator each year so we can actually see you know probably if we put your things in our model fritz it would show that if you didn't do those roth conversions your marginal rate's likely to be higher later than it is now right, and so right. that makes sense and that's how we run it out so we're projecting it out we're projecting a growth rate on the assets we're adding the inflation factor into the tax brackets just like it actually works so tax brackets are indexed to inflation so all of that's built into our model so we can quantify hey if I did these Roth conversions you know was there more at the end or was your fundedness ratio higher because we did that or was it lower and so there is a, is a way now we have to use a lot of assumptions in that model and so we try to be very conservative with those assumptions because we don't know the future and so then we can discuss well what are the things that could make this look more favorable toward Roth conversions well even higher tax rates than what we've used um, if one spouse if you're married if one spouse passes earlier you know having mm -hmm. more money in the Roth will be better so there mm -hmm. if you do asset location and the Roth assets earn a higher return now none of those factors are in the model but they're all things that could make the Roth conversions look 
look even better. So we kind of, we have a philosophy like the medical profession first do no harm. So if the Roth conversion didn't harm someone, you know, and it was a break even, now a lot of times it shows that it did improve the metrics of the plan, but even if it was at break even, there are these other factors that could say, well, if any of these things were to be true, that would make the Roth conversion look even more favorable. Now there's also times where we look at it and it doesn't make sense. So I don't want to, you know, there's people who are later in retirement, they've already started their social security, um, you know, they may be needing to qualify for the uh, health care tax credit. So there's all kinds of situations where we don't do Roth conversions, too. So it's not simply a matter of convert up to the 24 percent bracket. Well, let me add one more thing, too, that people probably aren't aware of. Um, the, the biggest reason I'm, I'm doing it now is RMDs, required minimum distributions, they will force a distribution of a certain amount. And that can very easily because your, your pre-tax is going to continue to grow. Right. So it's not what you have today. It's what you have 10 years from now when the RMDs kick in. And you multiply that out times the RMD factors, you can get into some pretty healthy forced distributions. That's number one. Number two, you cannot use an RMD and put it into a Roth. The RMD has to come into after tax. So if you wait until your RMDs kick in, you can only do a Roth conversion on amounts above and beyond the RMD value. So that's potentially an even higher tax bracket. So those are not a lot of people think about that RMD is not you can't convert it to a Roth. It's important to know that. Yeah. And I, I see the person that asked this question asked, you know, what percentage do we use to inflate the tax brackets? Right now we use two percent. Um, so we're inflating the tax brackets at two percent. And um, you know, it's likely that it's gonna match the CPI. Well, it's tied to various components, but um that's what we use right now is two percent. Um, this is the longish question, and Dana, it, it makes me think about, so bear with me, but it makes me think about a conversation we had in one of our planner meetings recently about delaying Social Security and how we really have to look at that, you know, ongoing because the answer isn't always a hard 70, right? So um, the question on Social Security, the plan is for my spouse, who's three years younger than me, to take Social Security at age 62, about 2,000 a month, I will wait until 70 to collect, depending on my health, about 4,000 a month. If I would pass suddenly at, say, 66, would my spouse receive the amount I would be eligible for that year, which is about 2,900 a month, or spousal benefits, 3,002 uh, a month, at full retirement age, her age 67, or what would have been my age 67, or could she wait until the year I would have turned 70 and collect the 4,000 a month? Okay, so let me try to answer that in parts, <laughs> the easy parts first. <laughs> so one, she could not wait until you would have turned 70 and collect the 4K a month. I wish she could, but she could not. Um, two, typically she's gonna be eligible for whatever you would get at the age you passed. And so, you know, if, if you pass at 66, I don't think that would quite be your full retirement age. It's going to be depend on, on your year of birth. But, you know, she should be eligible to receive whatever you would have gotten, you know, at that age if you had waited to, to claim then. Um, the spousal benefits... I'm not really understanding that part of the question because when you pass, she's going to be able to get the higher of her own or what you would have gotten at that age. That's basically the, the way it works. Um, so there wouldn't really be a, you know, an application, I don't think, of spousal benefits in, in that situation. I think that addressed it. Fritz, I don't know if you, if this no, is. I, I, I agree. The one thing that I, I thought about, because this wasn't obvious to me, you know, it was all delay, 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 which is what I'm planning on doing. But if you've got a lower earning spouse, they should claim early. You know, you can run there. There's an open Social Security. It's by Mike Piper. He's got yeah. a really, I've got, a, if you just Google Social Security on my, on my site, you'll, you'll find the calculator. And you can put in both incomes, both Social Security benefits. And it's almost always best to have the lower income claiming at 62. And then normally you wait till 70, sometimes not. My, my, I ran it recently and now it's like 68. So, you know, late 60s um, before the higher earner claims, at which point they get their spousal benefits. But don't forget the lower income spouse should claim early, normally. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's so many factors that the play into it. The other, you know, we will start with a analysis like Open Social Security. We use a software package called Social Security Timing. Um, and then when you take that and then put it into the bigger model where you're also factoring in Roth conversions, when you have Social Security, right, that's filling up some of the lower income tax brackets. So we want to look at it in context of all of the other factors also. So there can be reasons where we might, might want someone to wait till for retirement age. In general, I would say you have one lower earning spouse claiming earlier, and, and then there's age differentials that play into that can change the answer too. Yep, that's why we revisit it frequently. Um, yep. If Fritz is okay to share, um, could you give a few examples of funds you've selected for yourself after selling your target funds and moving into stock and bond funds? Oh, I, I couldn't pull them off the top of my mind, but they're just the basic Vanguard. Actually, if you look at the target funds, mine were all in Vanguard. So if you look at the 2035 target date fund, it will give you a breakdown of what the funds are that are in there. They're normally four funds. One's a domestic stock, one's international stock, one's domestic bond, international bond, I believe. Um, and, and basically, I already had most of those in my portfolio anyway. If not, for the sake of simplification, to Dana's point, I would put them in whatever I had that was closest to it, but they're all kind of S&P 500, you know, a, a, a broad index fund. That's what the target date funds are. And I, 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 where possible, I would buy exactly what they said. If I didn't already have that one, I wouldn't add another one to my holdings. I just put it in whatever I had that was close. Um, you'll both appreciate this. This is a follow-up from the person who asked the question about the Social Security. Um, thanks for clearing up. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry for the long question, but great answer. So, um, regarding Roth conversion, I'm nearing the top of the 22% tax rate. I'm 63, working less hours. Is it worth it to convert from a 401k to a Roth if it puts me into the 24% bracket? Well, I'll let Dana answer it. We need a lot more information. The one thing at 63, <laughs> you got to start paying attention to Irma, too. That's, yeah, yeah. I'll let you touch on Dana. Yeah, what Fritz just said, Irma is the income-related monthly adjustment amount for Medicare. So uh, they look at your tax return uh, when you turn 65. They look back two years at your tax return two years prior. But I wish we could answer that question. It's impossible. So literally, we have to take all of someone's data, put it into a spreadsheet like Social Security, when that's going to start, how much they have in a you know non-retirement assets and how it's allocated so that we can estimate the amount of capital gains, interest and dividends each year because that flows through to your tax return. So we have to, to put all of that out to see someone's tax rates now versus later and, and to project what their RMDs might be later to be able to actually answer that question. So we we really have no idea. I'm sorry, <laughs> there's just no way to answer it. Oh, that's a, it's a great um, response though. Uh, all the moving parts that we that have yeah. to be considered. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say on the armor real quick, I'm 61 as I mentioned, that's the other reason we're doing aggressive Roth conversions now. When I get 63 and ARMA kicks in, I'm going to redo the math and say, okay, what's that ARMA impact? And does that does that affect the, how much we do in conversions? You do have to factor in ARMA 63 and 64. Well, from 63 on. Yeah. Um, after many years of RMDs, unspent money will go into the after-tax accounts. How do you manage taxes on dividends and capital gains when you're more tilted toward after-tax investments? I'm projecting my taxes going away, uh, going way up after RMDs kick in. You know, we um, now prefer to use exchange traded funds in the non-retirement accounts. They're more tax efficient than the mutual fund version. They don't have typically the large cap gains distributions that you don't have as much control over. So what I'm saying in, within a mutual fund, there's buying and selling that happens throughout the year. And in a traditional mutual fund that has five ticker symbol um, at the end of the year, they're going to distribute some of those gains and you don't really know what it's going to be. And so it can can be a surprise in an exchange traded fund because of their nature. That doesn't typically happen. That can be one way to really have control over. Now, when you sell that exchange trade traded fund, that's when the capital gains is realized. And then 
The other is simply looking at the type of fixed income that you hold. And if you're in a higher tax rate, we're typically going to use municipal bonds, so it's tax-free. And if someone's in a, in a lower tax rate, we might use taxable bonds. Fritz, you know, any thoughts on that? No, I, I, I'm spot on with pretty much what you said. Muni's obviously, you know, I, I guess the thing I would think about too, as you're getting older, um, from a legacy standpoint, when you when you pass, yeah, you're going to have some tax burden carrying it, but also recognize when you pass, having that in after tax isn't all bad because it'll get stepped up in basis to your to your well. Now, if it's a joint account, it won't. But eventually, when if it's a joint account, when both people die, when it goes to your children they will get a huge tax benefit because it'll get stepped up. So there is some positive to having it in after tax. It's, it's better in an after tax than a before tax. Let's put it that way. Roth is best, but you know, you've got to do Roth when you can do Roth. And if, if you're at that situation, your, your limit, your chances of putting it into a Roth are minimal. So you're just going to have to deal with the capital gains taxes and uh, maybe do ETFs, you know, to minimize them, but you're going to, you're going to pay taxes on capital gains for sure. And dividends. Yeah. Does it make sense to dip into Roth funds in an if an unexpected expense comes up in order to minimize the impact on premium tax credits? Um, I think it could. You know, I, I don't see any reason why why that wouldn't make sense. I mean, you know, we would run out the impact on a plan, but I mean, there's nothing that pops up in my head as like, no, never do that, right? It yeah. sounds reasonable. Any the advantage, the advantage, you know, we talk about diversification. You want stocks, you want bonds, you want international, whatever. You also want tax diversification for exactly that type of a scenario. If you've got investments in a pre-tax, after-tax, and Roth, well, you can manage your income from year to year by, okay, I'm, I really need to reduce my income for some reason. Maybe you're on ACA and you're like, hey, I don't, I don't want to have any income. Guess what? You can pull Roth. You can have zero income. You can get a huge ACA credit. Yeah, you'll pay the price later because you're not getting growth in a tax-free account. But th there is some there is some strategy that can go into how do you use that tax diversification from year to year. Yeah, and just for our, our listeners, ACA stands for the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, healthcare.gov plan where you you can be eligible for a healthcare <clears throat> tax credit. About the one to three years of cash, is there a huge difference between CD ladders and bond ladders at the current rates? No, I've got both in mind. It, you can actually go in, if you go on to, I, I use Vanguard as I mentioned, and you can pull up Vanguard and you can look at like CDs and bonds and you can look at your time window and you can look at the rates and they're, they're almost exactly the same right now. Yeah, they are, you know, we, because it's our job, will scour for, you know, if we can get a slightly higher yield by laddering into three and six months treasury bills, we do. But, you know, we might be picking up a quarter point over money market right now. It's, it's, it's not much difference. Uh, the one thing I would say is you can get a longer yield to maturity with bonds. You can go further out with, with CDs. I guess you could do a five-year CD, but typically, like with yeah. with ours, once we get beyond like five-year bonds, I, I'm using the uh, Invesco, you know, they've got target bullet date shares. bonds. Yeah, bullet shares, where yeah. you can buy a 2028 bond fund, and it's a portfolio of bonds that all mature in 2028, so you don't have that risk of having to sell them before maturity. They'll run the maturity. It's diversified and you can go out, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years with bullet shares. So you can go way out, way further out with bonds than you can with, with uh, CDs. Yeah. And I, I would say, you know, buying individual bonds it can be more complex than, than buying stocks yeah. or, or funds. And so those bullet shares are a single ticker symbol with all the maturities, you get diversification packaged into a single maturity year. I think we use them um, also in when we have like smaller amounts that we need to ladder, and then we'll use agencies and treasury bonds for larger dollar amounts to ladder. But I think they're a great vehicle for people who do want to do it themselves. Um, this is I, I I know how this is going to be answered. Um, would it be smart to cash out four hundred thousand? Uh, refinance my home and add my savings to it and get the guaranteed lock income for life at 60000 a year? I believe the answer is going to be it depends and we don't have enough um, information. I'm not quite understanding the question. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. Cash in 400000 of what? Uh, so, so cash, uh, ca I'm sorry. I think cash in the, the uh, take the equity out of the home. Oh, 
take I, I'm, I so think. Does that, that do a refi or does that sell the house and move to a smaller house? Um, cash out oh, 400,000 refi my home. Yeah, refi the home. So you're going to take a 5%, 6%, 7% home mortgage and you're going to have 400,000 in cash and you've got to earn better than whatever your mortgage rate's going to be to have it come anywhere close to even break even. And you're not like, you're, well, I don't know. There's not enough information to answer, but that's kind of confusing. Um, it sounds. I will say my my gut is probably not. <laughs> yeah. I don't like yeah. that. Why would you increase your debt in retirement as a general rule? But. Yeah, I know Nancy was going to say it depends, which is true, but rarely would I want to take equity out of a house to invest in the markets or to invest in, you know, um, in retirement. That that would just rarely be the way I would do it. Our rough cutoff is, you know, if you can acquire debt at under five percent then you know no reason to pay it off early and if you're you know have debt over five percent then you would work to to pay that off early and so that's kind of a again rule of thumb you know i don't love those but if you want a rule of thumb there's one <laughs> all right um not a question but a, a, again a comment on a question asked earlier uh, thank you you've given me some good homework and more pieces to this puzzle uh, we are really just about at uh, the end of any questions. One of the last ones is what is the best way to roll 401k over to Roth IRA? Well, that one Fritz touched on earlier when he was doing Roth conversions within his 401k plan. So it depends on where your 401k is, but usually it has to be done in steps. So, you know, if your 401k plan doesn't allow what's called in-plan Roth conversions, you would have to roll the 401k to a traditional IRA, and then you would have to take that traditional IRA and convert it to a Roth. That would be the, the typical way you would do it. The Roth portion of your 401k can typically be rolled into a Roth IRA. Yep. But the, not, the pre-tax has to be rolled into an IRA, and then you do a conversion. Yeah, that's right. And I'm glad you said that because we had a you know a client in yesterday who you know has an employer match. He put everything in his Roth, but he was like, no, oh, this whole thing can get rolled to a Roth. And we were like, no, the employer match portion went in pre-tax, and so it was only like $1,500. So you know, but that portion has to go rolled to a traditional IRA. You can't just roll that portion to a Roth. Yep. Oh. Um, how much net worth should one have? I'm sorry. How much net worth should one have to earn more on investments to offset the cost of hiring an advisor? You know, I don't think there's a standard because there's all kinds of advisors, right? So there's advisors that will work hourly. Um, there's advisors that work with high net worth clients. There's just so many different options that it's hard to tie it to a net worth. I know for our firm, you know, we will say we typically serve people age 55 and over within 10 years of their retirement date or already retired who have at least a million in, in financial assets. You know, we just, we literally sometimes don't have enough planners to meet the capacity. And so the, the level of expertise and knowledge, that's, that's where we feel like it's best applied. But there's plenty of planners that have different business models that will meet with you one time. They might do a plan. I've seen, you know, there's a great resource, Jason Branning, Branning Wealth Management is a colleague of mine. And I believe they have a plan that's starting price point is around 20, maybe 2,500. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's a net worth minimum. Fritz, any, I don't. No, the only thing that's probably worth mentioning, and don't shoot me, Dana, because it's kind of competition, but the one thing to be aware of is if you're lower net worth and you're like, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense, The most of the mutual fund companies now, Vanguard, Fidelity, they've kind of got a hybrid approach where they're kind of robo-advisor, but they're also CFPs, and they, they, they do charge a lower rate, and that might be an option if you don't, if you, you know, if, if you have too low of a net worth, you're not going to have a lot of interest from the financial planning because, as Dana says, they've got limited resources and they don't want to take on that extra work if there's not enough of a return, you know, for them to do that. It makes sense. So if you're looking for a place and you're having a hard time, that's that's an option to look at as well. 
Yep. And I don't mind people mentioning any resources, right? Okay. I think yeah. everything has its pros and its cons. You know, we know where we shine and our clients love us. And then there's other business models that I think are perfect for different types of clients, you know? So to me, um, you know, it's all about sharing resources so the right people can find the right resources for them. Right. Um, any mention of the use of QLACs for Fritz's situation with longevity insurance where pension doesn't keep up with inflation? I'm not an expert on QLACs, but it's certainly um, that, that, that is a factor, not having a pension adjusted. Now, the reality of it is most, um, most annuities aren't pension uh, inflation adjusted now anymore either. Now, I don't know if QLACs are. I guess uh, you want to touch on it, Dana? Yeah, so a QLAC is a is a, called a qualified longevity yeah. annuity contract, and typically you put the money in now. You know, they're sometimes you know touted as oh, you reduce your RMDs because the distributions won't start till later, typically at age 80 or 85. And so my challenge with them, and in, in most of the planning we've looked at, is it's like creating a delayed tax bomb. So. If you don't live that long, you don't need that extra income, right? But if you do live that long, now you've got this chunk of, of guaranteed income coming out at that age. And, you know, it's all taxed as ordinary income. And so I just haven't found them to be the, the best vehicle for that. I've seen them used in terms of people that want to ladder guaranteed income for their entire, you know, retirement life cycle. So they might have a, let's say an annuity that's paid out for 10 years. And that's, you know, when that ends, their QLAC will kick in. So they want to build this floor of guaranteed income, then they can be a, a tool for that purpose. Um, I, I don't know the, the best way to, to keep up with inflation. What happens is spending patterns change as, as mm -hmm. you age. And so we find, and, and many studies support that even as people get into their mid seventies, um, even though they have the means for, to spend, they, their spending slows down. And so while we build in inflation into our plans, we, we find that oftentimes at that stage, clients will say, no, I don't, I don't need to increase my withdrawal, right? I'm not even spending what you're sending me already. And even that is the case, even with these new last few years, right? We we had people take no inflation raises sometimes for a decade. And then in the last few years, we did have people say, yep. But it's like they took one adjustment and said, yeah, let's go up $500 a month. And then the next year we ask again, you know, there's room to increase this. And and they'll say, no, I'm I'm comfortable. I don't I don't need it to go up. I think we have one last question, if that's, um, it's 10.01. 10, we're uh, right at 10, it's past Fritz's bedtime. So the last question, <laughs> last and question. if we didn't get your question but, answered, but, we but would Dana, follow up. I, I don't have to get up for work tomorrow, so it's okay. Uh, what? <laughs> well, well, you know what, well it's done. Friday, so we don't either. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> oh gosh, um, all right, so it, and it's maybe it's a good way to 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 end because it's going to be kind of one of those what depends. So I have twenty percent in the market, and basically the rest is currently in cash. How much and how quickly should we move some of that eighty percent cash into the market? Oh, and I'm sixty seven years old. Thank you. Oof. Mm. It depends. So, <laughs> well, let, 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 let me, let me answer ahead, it on a, more, on, a, on a broader level, just yep. regarding the age and, and whatnot. Um, there have been times where I, I'll get a big bonus or whatever, you know, when I was working. And, and as I mentioned earlier, when I was getting into retirement, we had kind of overbuilt the cash. You know, we were overly conservative. So we had we want to put money in the market. And you can always make the debate, is it best to do a big move now because over time you always get higher returns, it's smart, and that's mathematically normally the right answer. But from a peace of mind, the way I've always done it, whenever I've had the situations, I say, okay, look, I want to move, let's just make math. I've got to move $120,000 and I want to move it over a year. Okay, I'll move $10,000 a month and I dollar cost average it in. I set it up on an automatic transfer every month, $10,000. And by the end of the year, I've got it transferred. I didn't have to have that anxiety about what if there's a market correction right after I invest it. I don't know that I'd give that advice to somebody 67 that's 20% in the market though. So 
that's but as a general course target how much you want to move target how long you want to move it and look at what that would be as a monthly transfer and consider automating it that's one approach to how you get to where you want to try to get to yeah i like that approach um you know in terms of the specific amount you know we don't know so i i think you would go back to fritz's framework on the buckets right you know, how much do you have in cash to supplement your income? And then the next bucket, you know, you have another five to seven years worth of income in laddered bonds or, you know, safer investments. And so whatever would be left over, if that's more than the 20% you already have in equities, right? That could be the amount that you would target. And then how you get into equities, you know, I, I, the math will always say it's better to do a lump sum, right? You can do percentages. 73% of the market days are up and, you know, the others are down. So we could look at it percentage terms and say, yep, you know, but it's hard to dump a big chunk of money into the market. And, you know, we always have those conversations with clients. And oftentimes we might not dollar cost average in over a whole year, but we might do it over a few weeks. We might do it over a few months, depending on the client, really to, you know, alleviate any, you know, the nervous part of, oh my gosh, I'll just feel terrible if I dump it all in. And then we start into this bear market. And, and so I wish again, we could, we could give you a better answer. And I'm gonna throw one last answer because I see the last question that came in was, what is the average number of clients per advisor at Sensible Money? Well, right now it's under 50. And so we have you know, advisors that you know, are kind of bringing in new clients. We think it'll cap out at about 80. Um, you know, we think a, a good number is about 80 clients per advisor here is, is a reasonable number. And that's if you think about it too. It's it's an advisor, but there's also then a team, team. of people. Um, so it's it's a team to do the things that the advisor or the planner could also do, leaving the planner to do the things that just that planner can do. Um, yeah, so and I saw teamwork. a statistic recently, like the average brokerage, wirehouse, bank advisor had over 200 clients per advisor. I was like. <laughs> whole like how yeah. you know they're not really doing detailed planning at that point it's impossible if you had that that many clients per advisor yep. fritz thank you so much it was fun dana thank you nancy great job thank as you. always and dana nancy. i'm honored that you uh, thought highly enough of my work i'm not a financial planner but i i can you know i can i can hang with you i, I can, I can look back to the diy now that you... people spent two hours with us you know, I've got some knowledge on this stuff. That's why I'm comfortable being DIY. So thank you for having me on. I, I consider that a huge honor. It was fantastic. You are very knowledgeable and uh, I absolutely love it. Nancy, thank you so much for your help. Of course. Everybody, Happy. you stayed for two hours. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Our next webinar will be posted up at the bottom of our website um, probably by tomorrow. I think it's going to be June 13th. So you can check there. Good night, everybody. Happy Easter. Thanks.